We are team 542 and our project is on fire detection system with autonomous UAV. As it stands, wildfires are very difficult to predict. And despite all these systems uh, put in place, a large majority of wildfires are still only first predicted by the general public first. Our project goals were to create a fire detection system that's autonomous, obviously because of the gap here is that the current systems are labor intensive. We also want it to be scalable because throughout the year, uh, the government publishes a fire weather index and depending on different parts of the year, different areas of Canada are at high risk of fire. So we want to be able to add and take away drones as the area we need to cover increases and decreases. We also want the system to be accurate and we want the system to be responsive. And the way it works is basically a client server architecture. Each client consists of a drone and a computer that controls the drone. On board the computer is an image analyzer. And basically, uh, the controller has commands that tells the drone how to go about patrolling its flight path. The drone executes those commands and upon taking a picture, sends it back to the controller computer. It runs through the image analyzer, which gives it a prediction. Is or isn't there fire present within the picture? The controller is then connected via the internet to the backend server. Uh, it sends an HTTP post request consisting of the image, uh, the prediction of fire or no fire, and other data such as time and longitude and latitude coordinates. The images are logged in the database. Uh, and if there is fire in an image, an alert is sent to the front end. If you look over here, uh, by the way, all of this is a, this is a website. It's online. The server is deployed live. Here's an example of some sample alerts. I'll take you through the demo. So as you can see, the drone goes up. Okay. It's going to go forward. It's going to take some images. If you come, if you see on the screen here, we have real images coming uh, through. This is all coming in real time, and now it'll it'll come and land. So our project is about an application called the Dino, which is used for monitoring your plant's health. So we found that plants actually play a really big role in alleviating stress and anxiety. So we decided, hey, why not make our own application to help people track their plants' health, make sure they're getting all the nutrients they need. There's a lot of gaps in this market, so that's why we came up with the solution of Adino, which is a device and uh, application which you can use to monitor your plant or your plants. And basically, a lot of the, some of the key features of the app include uh, there's an in-app plant identifier, so you can take a picture of the plant, and then the app will identify it for you. There's also the functionality to take real-time measurements. So the sensor, while it's ta sorry, the device while it's taking the measurements from the sensors, you can view it on the app, and you can also record those that data will actually get saved and you can view recommendations based on whether it's out of the ideal range or not. And another feature we have is you can diagnose your plant. So if your plant isn't looking good, it has like some sort of disease, it's browning or something, you can use the app to identify what's wrong with it and it will even give you recommendations on how to fix that. Uh, we built Adino uh, on top of the regular features that the existing solutions have, like the soil moisture, humidity, temperature, and light. We also have a direct pH measurement, which none of the other sensors have, and a direct NPK measurement, which also none of the other sensors have. So the NPK is very important because it measures the actual macronutrients in the soil, so you know uh, how much fertilizer to put in or what type of fertilizer to put in. So uh, right here we have the Raspberry Pi and then we have a RS-485 uh, converter to connect with the NPK pH sensor. We have the temperature humidity sensor here. We have the soil moisture sensor on there. And then we have the light sensor right there. Okay, so this is the application. So basically uh, this is the main page and you can see how uh, the user can see all their plants. Let's say you wanted to see those measurements or take the live measurements. You can take the live measurements. It will ask you to put, put the device in and it will show the live readings here while it's happening and it'll send it over to the device and you can save that and it will populate this uh, and show you it on the plant info page. So here you can see this is the data we just got and for metrics that are out of the ideal range it will let you know whether it's too low or too high. If you click on that you can see the historical data. So right now we only have one data point right now which is a measurement we just took and it will also recommend you what, to, what you can do to fix the issue. 
our project is Quizish. Uh, we're group number 596, and we have built a new GS GSRS, a game-based student response system. So the motivation for our project Quizish actually comes from the creator of Kahoot. So specifically, the creator himself of Kahoot identified that the repeated use of identical game-based answering mechanism within Kahoot resulted in a wear-out effect, which lowered the motivation and engagement in students. So our solution, Quizish, aims to address the wear-out effect by using interactive multiplayer gameplay into the app to increase student engagement and motivation. So at a very high level, Quizish uh, is a full-stack web application which supports uh, multiplayer gameplay. And uh, as you can see in our system level design, there are four core components in Quizish. Uh, the UI, authentication engine, admin engine, and game engine. Awesome, so I'm gonna run you guys through a quick demo of Quizish. Uh, this is our landing page right here, username GamePen. Um, so I'm gonna be doing this demo from a teacher perspective. So I'll go to the login page here to show you the features. Uh, these are a couple of pre-made quizzes that uh, we've made, but I'm going to show you how to create a quiz. Essentially, you have a name, course description, questions. Um, after that, I will create the quizish, and you can see it show up on the teacher dashboard. I'm going to pick one that I've made already. I'll pick the first chemistry quiz. So I'm going to run that right here, and I get sent to this lobby page. You can see that I have uh, just a game ID over here. So if you mind, I'm just gonna send this to them real quick and you'll see them populate up here. We have two players so far, so I'll go ahead and press start game. And you'll see on one of their laptops that the game has started. Yep, and you can see them go through the game, play it. Essentially, you have to pick the right answer and press the space bar. Mice and I can see the other person moving as well. So we wanted to add in a lot of interactivity into the game. And as you can see, we also have uh, over, just the instruction yep. manual over here for the other people. And once the game ends, you see the scoreboard uh, with who's in the leaderboard. And that's about the end of the technical demo. We were assigned the project of uh, extending and maintaining a conflict-free replicated data type library. Basically, a conflict-free replicated data type, or CRDT, is a data type replicated across uh, other clients. And these clients can concurrently modify the data and uh, eventually uh, these states will be merged and the same across all the clients. So for our project we had to make one the library of CRDTs and then two also a demo application which we decided to make a graph editor. It works by I make edits on my laptop it sends uh, the state to a server and that server will then propagate it to other clients. So this is Focal our logic circuit diagram editor and it's also collaborative because it uses CRDTs to allow for multiple users to make changes to the diagram. So here I'll add an AND gate and I'll have Joseph's client go offline. So now when he comes back online, it'll be as if we made two concurrent changes. So for example, I'll add another node and connect the AND gate to the NOT gate. And let's say Joseph removes the gate. That's a conflict that we have. But with the use of the CRDTs, they'll be able to resolve this conflict. And now, Joseph, you can go back online and we'll see what happens. This was, again, this is allowed because the CRDTs enable clients to use the application online and concurrently. So now we see that the node that Joseph deleted is back on his screen because the CRDT we implemented prioritizes the addition of nodes over the removal of them. In the example of like uh, Google Docs, for instance, like they won't allow you to edit something if you're offline. So this mitigates that issue by um, doing an addition prioritize strategy. Exactly. This is our project, the Smart Plant Care Control System. We wanted to come up with something that will automate plant care. What we're doing here is currently not on the market. Currently, the automated systems only are based on timers and drip irrigation. So basically, the goal of our project was to create a closed loop control system that would be able to monitor uh, moisture and NPK levels in this plant and in the soil and dispense water and nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium solution according to our target value that we have stored in our database. Our control module is implemented on this Arduino microcontroller. It takes the control value selected by the user from the database and it compares it to the readings from the sensory module which is made up of this NPK sensor and this soil moisture sensor. 
and it runs a comparison based on a control algorithm to determine which solution out of water, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium should be dispensed. Now just to give a demo as to how the program itself runs, we are on our start page for our GUI and as you can see here you have two options. First option to select a plant, second option to take you to the monitoring page. So on the plant selection page, I click plant registration. Plant 5 is now registered and we have now been taken to the output page for Plant 5. So now we have some reading happening. We notice that the soil moisture percentage is printed in red because it's at a deficit compared to the target we set for 80. Uh, nitrogen is also in red. It's also at a deficit. Potassium and phosphorus are in green because they have been satisfied. So in a moment we should see the nitrogen pump. So the pump for this container dispense nitrogen into the soil. Uh, so we had nitrogen being dispensed. It was activated for three seconds. It will loop again and we will read more values. So now the nitrogen value is at 107, so it is satisfied. And we should wait again. Moisture should also, moisture is now satisfied 90%. So now that moisture is satisfied, we expect no pump to go off again until the fusion and uptake takes place. So I guess when we were trying to come up with what we want to do for a capstone project, uh, one goal we had was to improve the lives of engineering students. And so one feeling we all had was that we were tired of learning content passively through attending lectures and reading notes. So we decided to make a platform that allows students to deviate from traditional approaches and take on a more active learning approach. So by doing this, we wanted to make sure that students could get an input text, whether that's coursework from their textbooks or their notes, pass it into our machine learning model, and then have our model generate and output high quality questions, which are then displayed on a user-friendly web interface. So in terms of our actual project, we are creating a natural language processing model, and there are four key components that are unique to question and answer generation. These are the question and answer data set, uh, an encoder decoder model, keyword extraction, and distractor generation. So this is our website, and this is our team introduction page. Yeah, so here are the instructions on how to use our website, how you cut, copy and paste the text. So this is our main page of the website. Here you can see the logo and then the text box. Here you copy and paste the text you want to be evaluated on. And then uh, yeah, you can stretch it out to see if everything is included and then submit. Next, the multiple choice, choice questions will be uh, outputted and it's it takes a while. Our average response time is about 14 seconds, so it takes a while to run. Yeah, so here you can see our multiple choice questions, and uh, we have the restart button and the submit button. There's one correct answers, and there are different distractors for the correct answers. So distractors are actually the wrong answers, so they are very synonymous to the actual answers. And then you submit, and it goes to the short answer questions. Um, so for the short answer, we're basically just um, picking the keywords that couldn't generate uh, proper uh, multiple choice questions. So we can just submit it like that. And then for the fill in the blank options, um, so these are basically just uh, choosing sentences from the original text and then blanking out certain keywords. So we have a drop down menu that they can choose from. And these are basically all the keywords that um, can be potential answers. And then finally, it tells you whether you passed or failed. It gives you a little message as to what you should do next. And it also tells you the scores for each and every um, part of the test. And then it gives you a total score as well. In terms of the actual solutions, you can see which answers you got correct. And then you can also see which answers you got incorrect. And it tells you what uh, answer you chose initially and what the answer should really be. So it gives you a lot of feedback. So you can go back and review on it. Um, so again, it's the same for short answers, and it's the same for fill in the blank as well. And then finally, if you want to restart and try with a new text, you can just click the restart button. Our capstone project is about inference algorithms for mitigating adversarial agents in partial information networks. Many real-life engineering systems can be modeled as multi-agent networks where each agent may be able to observe and communicate with other agents. So because of the distributed nature of this problem, not all the agents are able to see and communicate with one another, and they're also, the networks may be vulnerable to adversarial attacks or noise within the network. 
so we deem those agents to be adversarials. So to show the generality of our algorithm, we're going to show you two systems where we can apply cumulative L2. So here's the setup. We have our cars in the different lanes approaching the intersection. And the catch in this example is that not all the cars can talk to each other and not all the cars can uh, see each other. Uh, but we'll see that with our algorithm, we're still able to navigate this unsigned intersection. And just like that, the, the purple car is sort of able to navigate the intersection and avoid the collision. We have created a water quality monitoring system. So we are Team 630. The motivation of our project is to create some sort of system that can kind of analyze the water and monitor it so that while you are paddleboarding in real time, you can figure out, okay, the water's safe, I can go for a swim, or the water's not safe here, I shouldn't go for a swim. Yeah, so the actual system that we designed has a few parts. It takes a Raspberry Pi, an Arduino for sensor input. The three sensors, a turbidity sensor, as you can see, total dissolved solid sensor, and a temperature sensor would be sent to this uh, electrical junction box, which is waterproof. The Arduino transmits that information to the Raspberry Pi for processing. The Raspberry Pi makes the final determination on the water quality, and then we pipe that to a virtual reality headset. In our professor's case, he has a one-eye iTap that will allow him to see in AR, in augmented reality, a HUD that tells him whether the water is safe or not to swim in. If it's safe, it would be green, and if it's uh, unsafe, it would be red, and it would uh, perform analytics through the Pi to read this data. Overall, our system is able to provide a good proof of concept uh, for what we are able to do using VR. We hope for in the future to be able to integrate this with our professor Steve Mann's VR goggles so that he can use this when he goes out paddleboarding.